<coughs> in some sense we see a lot of perfect prosthetic limbs. What are the hurdles that you foresee before we get to that stage? Uh, what you see as perfect is essentially a dexterous hand without any hurt sensing, without tactile feelings. And one of the challenges there is, uh, with those movements they look exciting, but the ownership is a problem. So amputee doesn't feel uh, such a hand to be their own hand. Weight is different, it doesn't uh, weigh the same. Then there is no feeling, yes it moves, what do you do with that? If I try to grab something and I cannot, the movement alone is not enough. So you have to have tactile feedback. Tactile feedback is a, is a major challenge. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for coming to speak tonight. Um, I wanted to ask you. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about issues with processing sensation rather than receiving sensation. So, electronic skin could be used um, for prosthetics to resolve issues with receiving sensation. However, I once worked with an individual who had a problem where they could not feel anything such as temperature on their skin, things like that. There was a neurological issue. Yeah. So I wanted to know if there was any way in which that could be resolved, like maybe a new connection being established right. that would override the... Right. So your question is mainly about haptics. So the difference between haptics and tactile sensing is when I try to touch an object, the signal is going from brain towards the object I'm trying to touch. But when I feel the signal then transfer back to my brain and that completes the loop and that's how I'm able to perceive objects. So what she's saying is that touch sensing gives us this one direction. Then what happens to the second one? So what happens is I gave an example here when amputee was able to was controlling with muscles. That's one example where you have signal coming from brain, you are able to then move the fingers. Once you move the finger, the electronic skin measures the temperature or pressure and it feeds back. Now, when it feeds back, it can be either through vibrotactile feedback, it can be sensory substitution. So, for example, a simple example for sensory substitution could be I can put two LEDs. If the temperature is quite high, they will glow, otherwise I would feel that they are the safe to grasp object. So that's one simple way, but vibro tactile feedback is I can wear a wristband or something which has an actuators and these can be programmed so that you have a localized feedback. So I'm moving this object this way, there will be a vibration pattern this way, so I would understand it's, it's supposed to move like that. Third, it can be direct, uh, you know, you can have neural interfaces. So directly connecting to the nerves. So you have to implant electronics inside the body and through that, there are small middle, there are, these are available, and you can then uh, activate the nerves based on the signal coming from electronic skin. That's very complex at this point. We have not, there are some examples, some in uh, animals, it has been tested, but uh, I think we are far from uh, neural interfaces. Currently, these uh, uh, viral tactile feedback, etc., is what we need. Dr. Inza, I'm enormously interested in what you have told us today. It is inspiring, inspiring beyond belief what you, you managed to find out. Uh, I'm especially interested in the care of people who have to sit on their behinds in a care bowl all day. And you see them rigging cushions, but they're still wriggling. They're at the stage in life when they can't have a conversation with you. Well, They've been your friend. Yes. And you've got a solution that might make her comfortable in her last days. <laughs> your mother would be very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish uh, she was proud of she had <laughs> So, uh, coming to what you said, I think that's an important point. And that's one of the reasons why robotics is, uh, uh, is gaining a lot of attention, including companion robotics, social robotics. So, even toy robots such as Patch have come. You can, they can respond to, to 
to elderly or you know, you know different age groups. So those that's why it is, uh, it's coming up very fast. So you can you can talk to them the way you want, <laughs> and that would that would make you more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the areas. But I would say we are far from uh, replacing humans. <laughs> That won't happen, and it won't happen. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if new technology could go deeper than scary. I'm thinking particularly of the use of uh, meshes in surgery, which you'll know from news reports there'll be a lot of problems of infection and rejection. Uh, that's something. Uh, uh, it's difficult for me to say because you know I'm not a biologist, and that question uh, currently we are working with uh, plastic surgeons in Glasgow itself. Professor Andy Hart is, is what we, we collaborate with him, and cell biologist. Um, yes, what you said is a problem, uh, and that's one of the areas why synthetic skin part is, is slow as compared to artificial skin. So when it comes to robotics, you are not looking at you know putting skin in a painful way or replacing if it is to be replaced, you could be replaced because the machine doesn't have you know, the, the pain sensation. But in humans, uh, it becomes difficult. Yeah. The synthetic skin integration itself is open in the this point. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much for a confusing <laughs> you started out by saying you were going to resolve a problem of robots killing humans. What was this problem? If you work in a foundry, you know that this hot metal will kill you. So you've got a big bloody sign that stops you from doing it. I personally have suffered under robotic surgery. I was convinced that by the surgeons, the robotic surgery was a solution. But they, they found exactly the problem that you've identified, that if you cannot see precisely, because you've got a camera pointed as you're inside your stomach, that happened to be a prosthetic, a uh, prostate, which was removed. But under the surgery, they managed to cut a hole between my bladder and my bowel because they couldn't see what the hell they were doing. And they couldn't feel it. Had they gone in radically, they would have actually seen it and they would probably have felt it. So I'm not convinced that robotics and robotic skin is a solution. I think we may very well be dealing with a problem which is an exceedingly minor problem, unfortunately, in this world. Uh, well, uh, that's fine. Uh, the, the reason why you feel is because uh, you have experience, and the technology was not available, and that's why you had this experience. If there was a happy feedback available, surgery would have been uh, much better. And that's one question that remains even today when I was showing you the Davinci robot where a surgeon is sitting remotely and robots are doing surgery. Then there's no feedback that comes. And that question relates to also uh, what she was asking in, in context with uh, you know, getting that kind of feedback. If surgeon feels remotely, can palpate remotely the tissues, then it will be more, uh, the, the operation will be precise exactly what they want to do, they will be able to do. Currently, it's not there, uh, and that's why the problem. Can I ask a question for that? Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was one, some years ago, I read an article about fiber uh, optics where, is that working? Uh, uh, fiber optics where you can actually sense at different points along the length of the fiber, I can't remember whether it's temperature or stress or something like that. Your talk focused on traditional electronic components, transistors and capacitors yes. and resistors. Does fiber optics have any application in your work? Uh, fiber optics has application. What you mentioned was you're basically pressing it and you are able to feel the pressure because when you press the light uh, to the fiber optic is disturbed and that's how you can get the exact location. 
when it comes to electronic skin, uh, the fiber optic people have tried that solution, but that leads to only a few sensors. Because fiber itself will take some space, and if you want to have skin over the entire body, it doesn't, doesn't work. So, uh, some examples, for example, uh, uh, in minimal invasive surgery, people have tried using optical fibers uh, to get some sensation, but it does not give the, the image over the entire surface. That's where the interest lies. So, that's what I was saying. In robotics, people have also tried putting some sensors on the fingertip and using some pick and place tasks, but that's a very limited use. So if you want to expand the use of robotics, then it has to be sensors all over. And fiber itself is like uh, like a wire I was mentioning. If you have 5,000 sensors, it becomes a problem if you cannot move the hand. So that way, it has some applications, but when it comes to human etc., it's a privilege to use. Uh, Trisha, just from the please. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed your uh, lecture. I it's most inspiring to see that this sort of research is happening in Scotland. But it begs the question as to uh, what other institutes, universities, science centres across the globe, in China, Japan, South Korea, or whatever it be, are we not be collaborating with? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, regional, if you look at the uh, First thing we collaborate with many, many groups, uh, and that depends on the, the focus. If you go to Japan, they are mainly focusing on robotics, which is the mechanical structure. And they have got the SEMO type robots, does all the you know, walks on the, the staircase, etc. But again, the intelligence part, part is, uh, is not much, cognition is not there, and sensing is not there. So that's where we do have some uh, some ongoing collaborations with, uh, with those people as well in Japan. If I look at robotics uh, from the American side, it's mainly focused on defense. Huh. Defense and <laughs> <laughs> So that human aspect, when it comes, it's in Europe. And that way, depending on the application, we collaborate with the uh, community. <laughs> Um, how is the European funding going to be affected? <laughs> well, uh, as for the information I have, uh, uh, there is no change uh, until end of this year. So we are submitting projects, we are getting funding as we used to. Uh, and we hope that uh, this will continue in future as well because uh, collaborating with, uh, with people all across Europe is very important. So, uh, I mean, yes, UK has uh, leading universities, but, uh, you know, we will be, again, talking to few cases all the time. When I go to research community, it just becomes few cases at some time, you know. Uh, and uh, we will miss that in the wider pool. Yeah. Uh, I hope we continue, but as for, as, as for the information I have, at least this year I don't see any problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm echoing everybody's enthusiastic presentation. I it's been a revolution. I've got basic electronics in my head, and then when you talk about them becoming smaller and flexible, that's why you then refer to organic transistors, which might put blenders or some salt in the casual. How, how to conceive of that. It sounded as though you were seeing uh, miniaturization of the traditional electronic components as the more successful way forward at the moment. Is, uh, do you have academic colleagues pursuing the organic side? Do you ever see that taking over? And if you could say a word or two more just about how the organic components work, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, well, the, the organic components, so there are polymers, basically organic polymers that you can make. Essentially, when it comes to electronics, you need, you have a terminal which you call source, the terminal which is called train, and on top is the gate. So when you apply certain voltage in the gate, it controls the, the 
charge for him between source and rain. Now this, this part, if you make where it goes over any polymers, you call it semiconductor polymers, that's where we call it as many times. Now many group uh, are doing it because it's much simpler to print, but problem there is the performance. Because it's polymer, the electron, when it flows from source to ray, it takes longer time. And that slows down the, the transistor. Transistor normally we use as a switch. In most of the electronics we use, is a switch on or off. So that's where switch is 0 and 1 is a digital world, so that's switch 0 and 1. So that's how we use transistor. If that 0 1 transition slows down, everything slows down. That's where the bottleneck is when we come to organic transistors. So that's why many, uh, even some countries they started with organic electronics. They could not do much. Uh, you know, initially it was quite popular, but then very quickly we came to the point that you can have kilohertz kind of transistor switching frequency. If I talk about Internet of Things or smart cities, connected objects, you know, my watch, shopping, your watch, etc. <laughs> Uh, then it has to be at least a gigahertz frequency. So, and when I go back and translate, calculate all these things, what I get to know is that I need material that has a mobility of about 1000. Means, in simple way, I need a material which allows electron to flow 1000 1, times faster than the organic material. That brings me back to silicon which is the material which allows. But silicon has problem it is brittle. You try to bend it, it does not. And that's why all the techniques I was presenting, they were kind of silicon, you thin it down, or you print it, or etc. Et and I gave an example that I was, I was saying that the performance of this transistor is at par with the, the electronics that we have. <coughs> I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've got time for all the questions. Is there any more? I'm back again, I'm still getting used. Yeah, go on, please. We have sat for an hour and we've listened, or an hour and a half, and we've listened to a very erudite speaker doing a very complex topic, which, in my humble opinion, is very limited. Because we have a You said that tactile senses were very, very important. Yes. But nobody in this arena at all has had any tactile experience at all. We haven't touched your friend, who you don't want to catch, Colonel, <laughs> Colonel Barai, but Myers, and, and you have been no way of touching uh, the three, four hundred people that are in this audience. We need to, I believe, look at a better way. One item I've heard of was a young lady in California, Betty Van Center. So the point step that a blind person had was actually connected to sensors which told the person GPS wise where they actually were, told them the temperature of all the surrounding areas, told them whether the, the soil was the ground was frozen or not frozen. Is this not a better way of using technology than trying to make an inanimate object? Yes. Actually, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I mean, I, what I presented today was one specific case where spectacles was put in context with robotics and some example in context of humans. When I talked about connected objects, when I talked about using some of these technologies, if I have this object, uh, which could be used by any person, blind person or, you know, any person, is a guiding uh, device. And it is covered with uh, sensors which give some feedback, vibration feedback, I'm more walking this way, and this device tells me now it's time to walk right, turn right, or turn left. So this thing can be applied in many ways in, in different type of applications. But today's talk was pretty much uh, focused on robotics and humans, uh, wearables. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, I came along tonight um, to take my mind off a certain problem that I've got. Um, for the first time ever, uh, the Philosophical Society has made it worse. <laughs> uh, and that is, to the gentleman in the red, uh, the problem that I've got is that I'm waiting for robotic surgery for the removal of a prostate. <laughs> Watch out! And he hasn't helped me. <laughs> Unfortunately for the year, it hasn't helped me either. Well, can I say I had robotic surgery for a prostate? It was extremely <laughs> successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are cases, uh, successful cases, but I would say robotics is not just about surgery. We should not uh, look at it in one context only. Robotics is also about going to space instead of sending humans. And uh, sending a robot with all this electronic spin, going there and repairing the space station, etc., and coming back without, even if we lose it, we don't lose human life. Robotics has many implications. So social robotics, I, I complain to robotics, I talked about where you need again speed to have that kind of two-way communication. Um, there are several other, other examples. I mean, we had recently in Fukushima a nuclear power plant where humans cannot enter in a hazardous area. What do you do? You have to detect nuclear leak, you have to stop nuclear leak. And the robots are, are, the, are the, the best there. I mean, they walk there, and if there is no skin, you cannot even handle a screwdriver. And you have to, how do you plug the, the leak? So there are areas, if you if you look on look for the sewage system and robot can be sent a snake by robot can be sent, but to move this robot you have to have some sort of feedback on the body. And then will be or it can be a mind detection. So there are several areas where uh, uh, robotics with this kind of sensory feedback is needed. We talked about humanoids today, that was the title of the talk, but examples are many. <laughs> Thank you very much.